Hello and welcome to the final lesson in our survey of church history, The Church's Story. In our previous lesson, we talked about the Pietist Revival. So what can you remember about Pietism or the Pietist Revival? Anyone have some, some thoughts from, from two weeks back? It popped up all over. Yeah. Yeah, this was something that was kind of a grassroots movement. It wasn't something that one person led top down, but rather something that came up in multiple places because multiple groups and people were having the same reaction. Um, anyone remember what it was, what the reaction was? Or what piety means? It was leading by your heart instead of your brain. Yeah, that focus on heart. And if we were if we were to talk about a head versus heart dichotomy, this would be the side that is more focused on heart. Yeah, very good. So this is kind of the pietism is like piety or devotion, uh, holiness, a focus on right living, on godly living. That's what piety is. And the pietist revival focused on that, following God um, in your actual life, in prayer, in Bible study, in service, uh, uh, in worship. Um, and so it had all of those components in it. And the historical lead up to this, we'll do a quick, quick recap of how we got here. So when we had the Protestant Reformation, we have these groups breaking apart from the Roman Catholic Church. Now we have new Protestant groups and they're really eager to get it all nailed down exactly what we believe. We know we didn't believe what the Catholics believe, so what do we believe? And so we have a period that we call confessionalization or the building of confessions or lists of doctrine that we sign up to believe. Well, that period of confessionalization, we also pointed out was confessionalization and conflict because there was conflict from within where people argue back and forth what do we really believe and they butt heads and that you know that's not always easy to come to agreement on right and then there's conflict without where these different groups were um, opposed to one another and because this is kind of as the as all those nation states of Europe have come to power and there's all these power struggles and, uh, you know, attempts to conquer and um, nationalistic feelings between them, there ends up being major wars, very devastating wars that really um, just uh, devastated Europe as a whole because it was so many nations over so long a time the 30 years war well 30 years war is a really long time to be at war and even though it's not really accurate people felt these were wars of religion and so the next period is a reaction against that they're saying we don't want to be focused on nailing down all these doctrines and fighting about controversies. We don't, that must be bad for the world. And so we have two reactions against confessionalization and doctrinal infighting. One, um, we did two lessons ago where we have the, uh, a whole trajectory of the church that embraces enlightenment thinking. So that is an emphasis on human reason saying like, well, you know, all we need is reason and science and we can get to God. And that is a trajectory that we're going to pick up again tonight. Um, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But the other trajectory is pietism. It's still a reaction against confessionalism, but instead of embracing human reason, it's embracing scripture and devotional practices. So that's how we get to pietism. Questions on that? Comments? Anything? Okay, well, when we... Um, so... Pietism produced what um, we sometimes call revivalism. And so, you know, pietism is happening like early 
late 1600s, early 1700s. And we'll, today we're going to do 20th century. Well, what happened in between? Um, there was quite a lot of revivalism going on in different places. In England, um, is how, that's how we get the Methodist Church. Um, the Wesley Brothers and George Whitfield start a bunch of piety groups. They're groups that are going to study the Bible and practice Christian disciplines together. They did not plan to break away from the Church of England, but there were conflicts over their new method. They were called Methodists as a pejorative. And it ended up, the issue became forced and they ended up breaking away. They were very evangelistic and Methodism spread and then it spread hugely in the Americas. So you get Methodism out of Pietism and that spirit of revival. Um, the first and second great awakenings are uh, major events in young American history. Both of them are an intense revivalist spirit that swept through American Protestants and caused, uh, gave birth to like tent meetings, camp meetings. Um, people were uh, intense with religious fervor in the Great Awakenings. And that is the second Great Awakening is where the American Restoration Movement came out of, which produced the Church of Christ and the um, Christian Church Disciples of Christ. So we get that revivalist trajectory in America. And that's also the trajectory that produces American evangelicalism. So this is, uh, you know, the word evangelical just means focused on the gospel telling of the good news. Um, Luther said he was an evangelical. But when we use it specifically in America, we're talking about a category of Protestant Christians um, that have in common several things. One of the easiest to spot is an emotional experience of conversion. So think asking Jesus into your heart as opposed to like a um, a baptism, for example, is an objective experience of conversion. But if you are the the evangelical tradition really emphasizes the emotional part of that. And so evangelicalism has been a huge force in American history. And that came out of pietism and the revivalist spirit. Questions on any of that? Well, um, the, that intervening period produces what we now have as the current kind of landscape of churches, right? We don't just have a couple of churches, right? What, what is our landscape of church uh, situation like? Well, how would you all describe it? Something for everyone. Okay, something for everyone. Lots of different denominations based on different paths getting sort of the same place. Um, something that came up in, again, Sunday school last week was Calvinism and um, predetermination. And, you know, I think that caused a split at some point too. So, you know. It has caused several. Yeah, <laughs> that that question has come up in every major um, path tradition. Yes, yeah, and still does come up. Yeah, so we we produce a um, sort of a landscape. Um, I'm going to share a whiteboard here. That this is a very simplified version, but I think it helps to see it. Um, you know, we've we've looked at the whole trajectory of the church here, and we're ending in the 20th century. And so here's what we end up with: we had the early church, and this is the period of all those ecumenical councils, and then in 1054 we have a split between um, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And so these two are then kind of the two main branches. Now this is simplified because like the um, Oriental Orthodox and the Coptic Church split off a little sooner than this, but this is mainly it. And in the West, it really just was the Roman Catholic Church for many, many centuries. 
Then in the 1517 and following, we get the Protestant Re Reformation. Out of that comes a group of churches that we now call mainline Protestant churches. The mainline churches are the churches that used to be state churches of Europe. So Lutheran is was the state church of Germany. Um, what what is Presbyterianism in America was like the the, the, the I think it's is it Dutch Orthodox du Dutch Reformed the Dutch Reformed Church um, the Anglican Church was the Church of England so state churches these are kind of the older denominations the older traditions because they come out of the Reformation. Then, in, you know, beginning with the Enlightenment, we get a huge splintering where we get into that something for everyone situation where all of these other churches split off. So free Protestant churches means they were never a state church. They're, they were free, uh, unattached to a, a nation. If that makes sense, these are called, and many of them are congregational, but some of them do have like governing bodies. So it's not free from any in that they're all congregational. They mostly are, but it's uh, they weren't state churches of Europe. So um, a, a lot of the Protestant, you know, the breadth of the Protestant um, traditions come in here. We have um, the baptist churches in all of their you know there's primitive Baptist. there's lots of different kind of baptist churches there's the churches of christ and the disciples of christ there's the um church of the nazarene there's the pentecostal churches so this is how we land and so the eastern orthodox church continues the roman catholic church continues these mainline churches continue and then we have all the protestant churches the free protestant churches as well any questions or comments on this just kind of curious about one thing and that yeah. is the amish where would those be, would those belong there also free protestant yes um you, you get the quakers started in england um in oh i'm trying to remember i think early 1800s and then the, these those kind of amish um Quakers, uh, Mennonites, mm -hmm. all of those kind of come mm -hmm. out of s sort of similar um, ideas, but at diff in different, yeah, they form different groups. Right. Okay. So that would be all in this period. Other questions or comments on this? Well, I wanted to kind of land us to something that looks like what, you know, that we can recognize as our landscape today. So there it was, um, the simplified version, but it helps to have a structure to think of people under. And today we're going to look at the 20th century. So what happened after all this history and into kind of our current time period? And much of what um, we have been looking at has been about kind of regular Christians in their churches, right? They're, they're focused on prayer, they're focused on revival. But Dr. Stanglin in today's video is going to focus on what is happening in kind of scholarly circles among prominent thinkers and theologians. And so it's, it's different from, you know, of course, there are still Methodists, there are still Baptists, there are still Church of Christ people, you know, all these people are living their normal lives, but the Enlightenment created and, and the embrace of human reason created kind of this, this uh, theological, um, academic um, movement that he is, he's going to talk about liberal Protestant theology. Now, that's a technical term. It doesn't just describe Protestants who happen to be liberal, right? This is liberal Protestant theology, In when he uses it like this, is the, the academics who said it's all about human reason. And you're going to hear um, him talk about the things that they couldn't reconcile with enlightenment thinking, like miracles, 
that's not scientific. We only believe in the scientific now. So even though we're Christians, we're going to deny that the miracles, we're going to get rid of all that that's kind of embarrassing to us that we can't we can't be focused on all this nonsense about miracles and we'll just focus on the idea or the metaphor of jesus and so it's it's very different from what you know regular practicing protestants are experiencing and yet it trickles down it affects people you hear this in circles even in common circles today where some people are like well you know i believe in jesus but i'm not going to believe in like you know all these non-scientific things i mean obviously that's impossible and so that that exists in our current landscape doesn't it um and so you'll hear kind of that and then He's going to talk about how a very prominent theologian kind of came up um, to counter it and sort of made space for a more traditional, a more orthodox understanding of Christianity. And this was Karl Barth. It's spelled Barth, but it's pronounced Barth. Um, and he'll talk quite a bit about what Bart believes. So kind of pay attention to that and be, and we'll discuss like, what did you notice out of Bart's stuff? Like what struck you? What was interesting? What was compelling? Um, then as he wraps it up, he's going to, he's going to talk about how things kind of get wild. You know, I said that the church is splintered. Well, theology really splinters to where there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't really even sound like Christianity anymore. So he's going to kind of attempt to capture some of that landscape and what happens. And then, so we'll, we'll discuss it when, when we're done. Questions or comments? All right, um, for those uh, who are watching after the fact, this is the time to go to the Center for Christian Studies website, log in using our class account, and watch video module 14, 20th Century Developments. Okay, we are back from our video on the 20th Century Developments. Um, and uh, what are your impressions? What did y'all think? Oh, you're muted, Paige. Fizzying was right. He went so fast. I. <laughs> yeah, I found this to be the most confusing video yet. <laughs> <laughs> it really, and it makes sense, right? Like if you were to try to tell someone who didn't know anything about it, like, let me try to describe uh, what the different Christians are and what they believe. Like, it would be an overwhelming task, wouldn't it? Like, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to really capture every bit of it, especially, you know, we're, we've been talking about the breadth, you know, that splintering of traditions, but now we're also talking about, like, a, kind of at an academic or scholarly level and a, a popular level. And so, like, it, it's, it's really a, a big and wide subject. Um, and we instinctively know that. We know that what Christianity has become is something very different from kind of the, the singular um, uh, groups of the ecumenical council days and of the early church. And even then there were variations. So, um, you know, he's, he's told us some and we, we know there's some strange ideas that as just you know i think christians from which would you say we're in the the enlightenment reason trajectory or the pietist trajectory So in the Enlightenment reason trajectory, you often have philosophy as primary, um, scripture as, uh, is demoted to not important, um, non-scientific type things like miracles, like the resurrection are jettisoned. 
So does that describe our Christian practice? No, we come from the pietist trajectory, the trajectory that says that scripture is our primary and authoritative source for faith and practice, that um, though we don't dismiss science, we yet believe that within reality is God and God's work. Um, and that includes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that is a miraculous event that is at the center of what we believe. And so we're on the pietist trajectory out of those two. And, and we still feel that tension, right? We, we all know people from different, it's a spectrum, right? It's not just two things, people from different parts of that spectrum, right? Well, what was striking to you? What did you hear that you thought, well, that's disturbing or that's good, that's interesting? What what pieces stood out to you? I did notice that he did speak. He didn't have the verse in the Bible, but I know the Bible says that, that we must decrease and so he can increase in our lives. Yeah, that I that is that is a fundamentally um, Christian idea that the pietist, and it, you know, it's followed on the pietist side, but that idea that, um, that everything points to Christ. When he talked about Bart's philosophy of um, the preached word points to the written word, points to the incarnate word, who is Jesus Christ. And, you know, that idea that everything that we do is to point to Jesus, to God um, revealed to us. Yeah. What else? I didn't take really any notes on this because I couldn't, because he was going too fast. The difference so fast. between religion and Christianity. Yeah, that was in um, the Bonhoeffer section, and I didn't go deeply into the, I didn't go look that up and try to understand what Bonhoeffer was saying with that. I, I, we have, re I have read some Bonhoeffer, and um, the, the pieces that I have read are very, um, uh, very Christ-centric, that that and and he also made some comments about this the um religion can't just be a, a tool of the state you know and that was something that bonhoeffer was fighting in nazi germany is the attempt to use religion as a support for the nazi agenda and he was fighting against that and that idea that true christianity can't be the version of religion that were that the Nazis were using, I think maybe where that comes from, but I didn't look it up. So, you know, but that, you know, there's obviously a tension there when some people are using religion to say, well, it means these things and those things are very unchrist like and we still encounter that now where religion is used as an excuse for things that if we just step back and say, are these Christ-like, we could not possibly justify them. So, and, you know, that sort of points to something he was talking about where it's early, early 20th century. It's all so optimistic. Human reason is so fabulous. Everything's going to get better and better. Technology is going to be the answer to everything. We can just philosophize our way to God. And then those two world wars come along. And what is the impact? What do we think about how human reason and optimists are going to, optimism are going to carry us through when we've been through two world wars? That changes everything about what we believe, about what humans are and what they can accomplish when you have suffered the horrors of war and the greatest wars in history. Right. So um, other comments on that? What else did you um, notice or think was interesting? The, um, I thought, I 
I particularly noticed um, when he talked about Bart, uh, talking about how God is knowable, that God, that we can know God. Um, and there's been a lot of thinking over the years, different from, you know, ancient Greeks all the way to current day that says, well, you just can never, you can just never get to God. He's just unknowable. And yet, um, if you uh, did the preparation reading for today, it was from the Gospel of John, the first chapter. And that reading concludes, um, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father through the grace, through grace and truth. And then verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And so that idea that, yes, we can know God because God wants us to know God. And Jesus is that revelation incarnate in the flesh, living with us, dying for us, shepherding the church. So that was kind of that was what I found most meaningful out of the Bart section thoughts any any comments I'm not sure we should really be talking about Bart since none of us have read all of his stuff yeah the the suggested reading that Dr. Stanglin provides for this week you can find it on the study page is excerpts of Bart but then you won't have read all of it so you won't be able to say anything <laughs> I don't I don't know that I, I know that most people have read all you know even the experts since he didn't write his fifth book, we can't. Oh, he's unknowable. Bart himself is unknowable because he yeah. didn't write his first fifth book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what did he say? The did he say pet? It wasn't the patricians, correct? It was a like the pastricians. When the, was this? The French Catholics. What was that word he said? Do you know? Oh, um, I did not look that up. It was a it was a specific sect among the 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 French ha like, you know, when you you know how you do the whole thing about like Henry the Eighth and the Catholics versus the Protestants in Ireland and like it's its whole own history. Well, the French have their whole own history that I know even less of than I know the whole English history. <laughs> so I do not know, but um, yeah, yeah, it was a specific thread in French theology. Sorry. Well, what uh, let's talk about um, this series as a whole. What has the is, have, are your takeaways from having studied church history? We lost someone. I thought this was a very interesting study. Mm -hmm. There's certainly plenty of material in it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting to, you know, to go over the different swings and clear, like, oh, we have to codify our beliefs. And these beliefs are going to cause so many exclusions of other of people. And then it's like, well, we have so many excluded people that we should get rid of our codified beliefs. We should, those don't really matter. And then it's like, oh, got to bring them back. Got to decide what we believe so we can exclude people. And then we have to include people. And it's just. And maybe we and see kind of in miniature, some of those swings in our own, like mm -hmm. Christian lives, like maybe some of that exists in shorter term in the church today or even in our own walk yeah it kind of feels like it's probably the same it's just like the way our whole society is sped up by technology it's probably the same it just is actually swinging faster it's faster yes yeah yeah and globalism yeah the things when you communication is faster the swings are faster yeah I noticed, you know, we did a lot of doctrine um, embedded in our historical study. We had to do quite a bit of like, this is what this means. This is what this means. And so I, I always think that's really helpful, first of all, to understand the doctrines because they came out of a story. 
but also um, you understand the stories more when you know what they were fighting about. And, you know, some of those same doctrinal differences are still, you know, we, we talked about how they're still present today. So I thought that was meaningful. Yeah, it's like the divisions that, that we have today are the same ones that they had back then. Yeah, yeah, some of them are. And then we have more, it seems like. We, have, we are very divided. I think that's um, something that has always, I've found discouraging about the church is how divided we are. And yet, looking at the study of history, I think... Yes, the Christian landscape is complex and every little state thing has its backstory tracing back through history, but God has carried the church through the mess that we have made of it. And we we're left here, you know, as Christians, not that want to accommodate Christianity to match up with worldly ideas. We're Christians who want to have the story of Jesus and the revelation of scripture as the standard to which we conform our lives, that we have a tall task ahead of us because that's not even how people think. People don't even think in terms of objective truth anymore, especially on religious topics. That has been, you know, the enlightenment thinking relegated religious topics and morality to the realm of opinion. And we believe that actually God has a true standard. There is a reality and there is a moral reality set by God that is objective truth. Well, that is very countercultural. And so knowing where we came from and how we got there and how this thinking has progressed, I think maybe helps us some in that. And it may help us living um, into a belief that isn't the, the popular way of thinking. Um, the study of church history has told us that there were troubles at every stage. There was persecution all the way at the beginning, as there still is. There was false teaching all the way at the beginning, as there still is. And sometimes we're worse than others, but God has continued to carry us. God has been faithful. And I want to end with a, a little um, anecdote from the um, ecumenical movement. Um, Dr. Stanglin mentioned that. One of the things that they found when they started pulling all these traditions together for the ecumenical movement and trying to say, well, what is it that we can agree on? What can we all um, assert and sign up for that will, that will be a, something that binds us all together? And the thing that came out of that, that all of those different groups could agree on was the Nicene Creed. The one that we read from those first and second ecumenical councils all the way back to the beginning. So that even though we've diverged through history, there is this common core of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit that binds us together. And so I feel that really shows God's faithfulness, and it gives me hope for the work of the church going forward. Questions, comments, last thoughts? Thank well, thank you, Deanna. You. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for your participation. And I would love to have your feedback on, especially on this video series and how this worked and what you thought. And so I have a, a what do you call it, a, like a Google form for a survey and I sent it out to you, but I'm also gonna put it in the chat here for a minute. So you could just like immediately click on it and do it. Um, Cause you know, if you get away, you never wanna get back. Um, and you don't, if there's a bunch of questions, fill out the ones that speak to you, that you have something to say on, you don't have to fill out all of them. Okay, should we, anything else or should we go to our prayer time? All right. Stop the recording.